Okay, folks, I think we can, uh, I think we can get started. Um, let me just make sure that no more are coming on. Yeah, we're good, we're good for, we're good for the moment. Um, our speaker tonight, our guest tonight is Saper Haddad, who is a musician. He's a UC Davis alumni. He's a friend, uh, none of which have anything to do with why he's here tonight. He's with us tonight because he just wrote a book. Um, 100 Sweet Promises, which Sapir has always been an outstanding storyteller. And he's finally got one that he put down so that it, it, it will last. It, it, it's the story of his grandfather. It's his grandfather who was an accomplished uh, Iranian composer, went to study up in St. Petersburg uh, under Rimsky Korsakov and other famous Russians in the turn of the last century. While he was there, he fell in love with um, and, um, well, fell in love with, I'll just leave it at that, with the, uh, with, uh, with the czar of Russia's only niece, his beloved niece. And all of that is true. That stuff all happened. Um, now, Sapir um, has embellished that a little, just added to the story, filled in gaps, but it's a historical novel. It's based in truth, but he's added to that. Um, and just tonight, how this works is I will ask questions for 10 or 15 minutes, and then we want to open it up to anybody who has questions. And the way, because of this webinar, the way it works, if you wouldn't mind, type into the Q&A, either your question or just a quick summary in your name, and then we'll call on you and we can unmic you, and then you can ask Sapir directly, whatever you want, because Sapir has done this enough to know that he doesn't have to answer whatever he doesn't want to. Um, but before we get started, I just want to say that he, uh, Sapir is also, he graduated from UC Davis and got his master's degree in international agricultural development. When I met Sapir, uh, which I think was probably watching soccer games because both of our kids played soccer. Um, mine maybe not terribly well, but we played soccer and um, uh, he was working at the EPA. He was a specialist at the EPA, um, but, but he's really better known for his uh, for, for the band he plays with. He and a high school friend, um, Shaheen, Shaheen's last name is? Shahida. Shahida. Yeah. Uh, and they're known as Shaheen and Saper. And they're very well known. Uh, I'm sure some of you on this call have heard of them, but if not, they are well known in the uh, Persian American and in Iran community. Um, but, but, but the reason he's here is, uh, is about the book. So, so I'm going to fire out some questions and we'll, we'll go back and forth. Saper and I have talked enough that we know that, uh, I think we've said this, him and I could probably talk about nothing for hours. So we will try our best to talk about something for minutes instead and we'll keep it short. So nobody get awkward if I'm interrupting him or he's interrupting me. So, so uh, let me start with this, Saper. Your book is, takes place, like I said, the turn of the century, um, mostly in Russia, although it goes through several other countries, including Iran, of course. Um, but that's the opening chapter. The opening words are 1978, and it's you written in, uh, you know, talking about yourself in, in Tehran. Talk yeah. about that and tell us why that's where the book begins. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. And, you know, the UC is close to my heart, having studied many years there and living in Davis. And so uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, yes, it starts out in uh, actually on September uh, 8th, 1978. This was the day after martial law was declared by the Shah's government, the Pahlavi Shah's government. Um, there were a lot of disturbances and people were starting to demonstrate and uh, there were a lot of gatherings that the government didn't want people to get together and, and start to have demonstration. And so uh, the military was called out and this was the first time I had ever seen that in Iran, uh, where tanks were stationed at each corner of a square, for example, and uh, the police were backed up by gun toting soldiers. And so it really felt like a movie to me. And so I was looking out the window. Um, and, and you're a high school student, is that right? No, no, no. I had come back to Iran for summer vacation. Okay, I'm sorry, that's right. So you're already a yes. David student. Yes, and I was totally oblivious, uh, thinking that this is really just like a movie and it's going to be over. Not knowing that when I left that summer to come back to the States, I would never go back for 35 years. And my grandmother, who told me this story, this was the last time that I saw her. 
And so the disturbances outside were so exciting and I was looking outside and so such certain events happen. I, I won't say it because it's in the book, but um, I went to go sit next to my grandmother and we were watching the newscasts on, on TV and they kept talking about uh, Khomeini uh, recorded some messages and put it on cassettes and sent it to the mosque and all that. And I asked my grandmother, who is Khomeini? I've never heard this name before. And she told me his history that he was a cleric. He gave fiery sermons against the Shah's government and he was ultimately exiled to Iraq. Uh, and from uh, there he went to France and then from France he was sending these cassette tapes. And so um, I asked my grandmother, I said, well, who is, uh, how come we didn't know about him? Uh, we, I went to the international school in Iran to the, uh, it was called Iran Zamin, Tehran International School. We got all kinds of materials we could read uh, that weren't even available on the street. And I was so shocked to not having, ha had even heard his name. And I told her that, and I said, it's very surprising. She says, it's not surprising at all. There's many things you don't know. And I was like 20 years old at the time thinking that I did know everything. And she said, uh, I said, like, what else? She said, like your grandfather, did you know that he fell in love with a Russian princess? And I said, no. And then I started thinking, what else is there that I don't know about my own family? I didn't know about Khomeini. I don't know about my own grandfather. And so she started then at another sitting, the last time I saw her telling me the story of my grandfather going to St. Petersburg, as you said, as a child of 13 in 1898 with his father to study at the uh, St. Petersburg Conservatory. Uh, his father was named Salar Moazaz, and we'll be having pictures later on so people can put names to faces. But his father, my great grandfather, had written the first Persian national anthem. And so music was really in the bloodstream of this Minbashian family. And uh, he takes his 13 year old son with him. He had the foresight to do that at the time. They lived together for five years in St. Petersburg until at the age of 18, he leaves, uh, so my great grandfather leaves my grandfather in St. Petersburg for an additional two years. And then my grandfather comes back to Iran. So my grandfather spent seven total years, 13 to 20 in St. Petersburg. So I don't want to give away any of the books, but so I'll, I'll leave it in your hands. But um, this, 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 this love he has for the, for, Irina, the czar's yeah. niece. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it was not a simple love affair. Uh, so talk about some of the pressures that they were under. And well, it was very interesting for me to, first of all, hear my grandmother talk about my grandfather's love for another woman, as if it was <laughs> she was talking about somebody else, you know? Yes. And I, at first, I thought maybe she'd be embarrassed to tell me this. Uh, I asked her, why, why didn't you tell this uh, story to anybody else? And it seemed to me that either she at the time wasn't ready to tell anybody else or that she thought nobody would give her an ear really about that they wouldn't believe it. So when she told me the story, she told me certain details that helped me write the book because uh, the love affair with Irina is a lot of the stuff she talked about, how their hands would meet on the piano keyboard and how my grandfather would say his heart would thunder and want to bounce out of his chest when their wrists touched and things of that nature. And so when my grandmother gave me a lot of details about this, this relationship, uh, there was no Google back then in 1978. So I couldn't really, unless I went to the Library of Congress or something, I couldn't really uh, research it until Google came around and I did research it and realized a lot of the things she said was accurate. So, 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 so you are, um, I mean, you're an artist in that you are a musician. Um, this is a very different kind. I mean, writing fiction is completely different. What talk about the difference? I mean, what, what's what was harder for you? Was it harder to compose music or to compose a story? Much harder to write a book. Much harder because when we write music, Shine and I, um, but but the process is the same. So when you write music, you're writing ten or eleven songs, or these days it's just singles. And so a single usually doesn't take six years to write. And when I was going to write this, I told Shaheen, I said, uh, let us take a break. Uh, he, he is so busy with his own uh, artists and he has his own studio. Uh, so he was fine with that. But I said, it'd probably take a year. He said, OK. So six years later, when I sent him a copy of the book as a gift, I wrote a note that I apologize. My timing was a little off. <laughs> but it is a very difficult process. 
uh, I thought it would be done in a year, but that's because I was ignorant. Uh, you know, you're an author, so you know exactly how hard it is to write. And um, the process was the same, however, where I didn't start out with knowing where I want to go at the end. I just wrote every day and let the story take me forward. But I did have certain anchors, which were these uh, tales that my grandmother told me, and also newspaper articles that I read about my grandfather. And so there was something to, to tether me to, to a straight line throughout the story. So I always tell my students uh, to always think of your audience. You know, you always, when you're writing for whatever it is, think of your audience. When you wrote this, who was your audience? Who are you thinking of? That's a very good question. Thank you for asking that. My children. Because, uh, as you know, I dedicated the book to my two sons, Kian and Ryan, uh, so that they would never forget their Persian roots. And that was because, uh, you know, here after 9-11, there was a lot of um, animosity towards people of the Middle East. And so Iran got lumped into that, even though Iran had nothing to do with 9-11. And so my kids at school, they would get kind of, uh, sometimes get hassled, you know, some people would bother them and stuff. And at some point I told my wife, I said, I want my children to see Iran in person, because if their image of Iran is just going to be from what they see on the news and what their friends tell them, uh, then that's not the Iran that we grew up in and that we are so proud of. And so in um, 2010, we took a trip with my wife and two children and we went to Iran and I took them to all the places that I wanted them to see because of the richness of this culture, the history, the historical sites, the people, you know, uh, the first world empire um, has a lot of things that are very interesting to the rest of the world. But unfortunately, because of the political situation, those always get kind of shoved under the rug and the beauty and essence of this great culture and, and um, people that is sort of lost in the shuffle. So they were my audience. I wrote it as a document that they could have, maybe they're not even gonna read the book now, but later on, some, at some point when they start trying to figure out who they are, or where they came from, uh, I wanted them to have at least it documented down instead of just the oral tradition of telling them the story. So I think uh, Mark's, uh, video has frozen. Uh, so I'll tell a little bit about more about our trip to Iran. When we went to Iran, the real reason why I decided to write the book was I was sitting in a taxi with my wife and two children, and we were going to Shiraz, uh, to Persepolis from Shiraz, which is about a 40 mile drive. And Persepolis, of course, is the ancient capital of Persia, where Alexander of Macedonia, and I don't call him Alexander the Great, Sorry to my Greek friends, but he destroyed uh, my ancestors' realm, so I can't call anybody who did that great. So Alexander of Macedonia actually destroyed Persepolis, but I wanted my kids to go see that site, sit there, look at it, feel the, you know, the history there. And um, on the way there, the taxi driver uh, noticed my wife was American. We were speaking English, and he, with broken English, turned uh, to my wife and he said, uh, you know, hello, how are you? Welcome to Iran, all that. And then I asked him, I said, where have you learned to speak English? And he said, at the garrison in Shiraz, the military garrison in Shiraz. And my uncle, General Fatullah Minbashian, had been the commander of the Shiraz garrison in the 60s. And I told him, I said, oh, that's interesting. My uh, uncle was the garrison's commander. And so right away, he pulls over the cab, starts saluting me says he's not going to get the fare, he's not going to accept anything from us, and this is a, a, you know, he's just going to do his favor for us, because it was my uncle that had brought these English classes for these uh, soldiers to learn English. And he was very appreciative and started telling me a ton of stories about my uncle that I didn't know. Uh, and my wife turned to me there and said, you have to write this book, because if you don't do that, uh, these stories of some man sitting in a taxi cab in the middle of basically nowhere, um, will will be gone with our generation. And so that's a, another reason why I wrote the book. Um, I might be back. Yes, I can hear you at least. There you go. Yeah. So um, for you Californians, I don't know if you can hear this where you are, there was a huge crack of lightning and then the internet disappeared. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. 
I've been running around trying to find a phone to get on. So I hope that you have answered your own questions well here. Oh, yes, uh, yes. I've, uh, you can so, just uh, leave if you want right now. <laughs> let me, um, no, uh, because actually I want to, I want to ask you about your experience you were, when, when I was so rudely interrupted, which could happen again. Oh, I just heard it now here. Yes. Yes, we're storming here. Um, you talked about the discrimination and the stigma yes. for among some Americans of being Iranian. Yes. You were a student, an Iranian student yes. at UC Davis. Yes. When Iranian students took over the U.S. Embassy. Yes. So tell us about, I mean, that was what, November of 1979. Nine. Yes. What do you remember about that day and what was that experience like? Well, it was terrible. It was a terrible day. I remember my roommate uh, was uh, at a neighbor's apartment and I heard this news and I knew that that was an act of war. And I went and knocked on the door. He came out. I said, oh my God, you don't know what's happened. And he kind of wasn't sure. He said, really, you're sure? I think this will be, oh, they've done this before and all that. And I said, no, this is very serious. Can, so can I just interrupt to ask a question? Because yeah. again, we're talking about the dark ages. You didn't hear this on CNN, right? Because I don't think there was no, no CNN. Not on, no, not on CNN. So, so we, what do you, you hear this on the radio? I mean, what? Yeah, yeah. I had a shortwave radio back then. That's how I would get the news. Wow, I, would okay. listen, I would listen to shortwave BBC and the German uh, Deutsche Welle and whatever it was. And so uh, I, I heard it. And then, of course, the next day it was in the papers and in the evening news. And Ted Koppel made a career out of it, you know, 444 nights. Uh, but um, it was very disturbing because um, I had never felt that kind of, I, I can call it, I guess, racism maybe, or um, I don't know what, what one would call it, but uh, I had never felt it until this event. And uh, at some point, my roommate, the same gentleman I mentioned, Shari, or is his name, we hid in our apartment because they, some, a group of, a mob of drunken frat boys, you know, I don't know if they were just doing it for fun or whatever, but basically came and, you know, threw our bicycles over the wall and started knocking on our door, come on out, come on out. And, you know, we went and hid in the back room. It was very, very frightening. And in some classes, you know, people would tell me that, you know, Davis was an ag school. So there was a lot of people from the rural areas. Uh, it wasn't like in, being in San Francisco where everybody would be cool about it. Actually, people from San Francisco called me and said, can we hide you? You know, if you need a place to hide, come stay with us. But, um, you know, people would be uh, doing like shooting signs behind my head in class, that kind of stuff. And uh, it was very, very disturbing, very upsetting. Um, it was a hard time. And a few uh, people got injured, actually, got beaten up. And actually, On the Davis people, campus? Uh, in California, in Fresno. Like, was uh, your family safe back in Iran? Yes, my family was safe back in Iran at the time. But, you know, my father had worked for the Shah, so he was unemployed. And now he was just sitting home. So you finished the term? Oh, yes, yes. Luckily, yes, we finished the term. And... You know, our whole goal was to go back and work. I studied international agricultural development. Uh, the U.S. doesn't need agricultural development. The U.S. is the most developed agriculturally. But um, that th those whole plans went by the wayside. And it was so funny because when I was in Iran, I wanted to study astronomy. And uh, uh, Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin and uh, Michael Collins came to Tehran for their world tour after they went to the moon in 1969. And I met with them and I have pictures with them. Uh, and I really wanted to be an astronomer. My dad at the time said, where do you want to live? Do you want to live in the States or in Iran? And at the time, I, you know, I was a 20-year-old kid. I said, well, I want to come be with my family wherever they are. And you guys are here. So, And he said, well, in Iran, if you study astronomy, uh, basically at that time, the only job was to make calendars and stuff. You know, <laughs> So pocket calendars by astronomy. So I didn't study astronomy. I studied agriculture. And then by chance, if I had studied that astronomy, I was in California. I could have gone and worked with uh, my favorite organization, NASA. <laughs> but, you know, that's how life is. Do, um, is, how, how do you think this will be received in, this is being translated, I understand? No, but it's in the process of being It's in the process. So yeah. how will this be received in Iran, do you think? I think very well, because uh, if you, as you've read the book, it's quite apolitical. I haven't, I don't take any sides. I just try to uh, express the, uh, how I was feeling during the events. I just talk about the events as they were occurring. I don't actually have any editorial 
uh, comments about this was good or that was bad. Um, and, and basically what I'm doing is highlighting the beauty of the Persian culture, Persian poetry, Persian literature, uh, Persian food, the sites, the fables. So there's nothing for an Iranian in this, no matter what your persuasion, to be upset about. I think they should actually be happy <laughs> about it, you know, especially getting this kind of reception from people such as yourself. All right, so let me, um, I've got a thousand more questions. I really do, but I'm gonna, we, we have some questions coming in. Um, if you put your name down, I will unmute you, but some of these people have not, so I'm just gonna ask the question. I love this question. So what do your children think of the book? Did they read it? What do they think of it? Well, well, there was a lot of arm twisting involved <laughs> in that. <laughs> you know, kids these days, unless it's in a game or on an iPhone or something, even though there is the ebook of it that you can read it, but they both bought the book, but to read the book, one of them is halfway through and one of them has just started. So <laughs> I'm thinking- You've seen the dedication to them, I hope. Well, you know, what's so funny is that when, when um, we did the music, the Shine and Spare music, my kids, you know, they liked it. It's instrumental, instrumental music. So it's not rap or, you know, hip hop or anything. So they never, I, I never felt that they considered me a legitimate musician. And so we not. go to, but we went to Iran and in the airport in Shiraz, as we're coming back, I went into a store to buy some music. And uh, the lady said, what kind of music do you like? I said, well, instrumental guitar. And she said, well, we have this great five package CD that we'll give to you for a great deal by two guys who live in America. Uh, they're great. I said, what are their names? She said, they're Shaheen and Saper. And uh, I showed her my card basically. And I said, this is me. And she of course didn't believe it, but then when she did, that was when she turned the volume up to, you know, 11, as they say in Spinal Tap, but uh, really loud. And I was very embarrassed. But that was the first time I noticed my kids actually being impressed that I did music. So I'm thinking some event has to happen for them to be impressed that, <laughs> that I wrote this book. <laughs> um, somebody asked you if you have plans to write more, more books. Well, you know, after, uh, again, you as an author, probably know this once you've done one and it took six years you just can't think of even writing one word let alone a book but I never like to say never uh, because there's so much uh, that I can write still about the uh, like a prologue to this like Nasser Sultan my grandfather at the age of 13 from his viewpoint how it was to travel in this very difficult way to get to St. Petersburg it's almost 2,000 miles away um, from Iran and live as a teenage boy with his father, not see his mother for seven years in a foreign country. Uh, so there's a lot of material that I can use to write, but no, right now, no, I want to do more music now. So uh, Moon Jung, Moon Jung Kim has a question for you. We can unmute her. And while we're waiting for that, just uh, uh, Kava and Mitra send in a comment saying, I love the book and hope you continue writing. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's very kind. Um, as did somebody else who's anonymous said, I loved the book. So that's nice. All right. So Moon Jung, go ahead. I, I'm afraid we might not be able to see her, just hear her. Oh, hello. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Hi, yes. Moon Jung. Thank you. Oh, hello. Um, so I haven't read your book, but I do find the, the topic of your book to be extremely fascinating. Um, and I understand that you did research for both Iran and Russia in writing your book which sees like a meeting point of the two cultures and the romance between your grandfather and the Russian princess. Yeah. Um, but regarding Imperial Russia specifically, I was wondering if there was inter anything interesting that most people don't know, like a really cool fact that you learned while looking into the St. Petersburg Conservatory, the Tsar, the princess, et cetera. Like, um, I don't know if this is too intrusive about your book, but I was just wondering if there was something that you could share. Well, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, the interesting thing I found was, uh, I didn't even write this in the book. There was this rivalry between Tchaikovsky and uh, Rimsky-Korsakov, who was my grandfather's professor and who my great, who, uh, my great grandfather's professor and who my grandfather was rushing to go back to Russia just to study under him privately. Uh, and it was so interesting because I love both of these composers' music, but um, it was about the fact that Tchaikovsky was doing really well and Rimsky-Korsakov 
was just teaching at the conservatory, but wasn't producing anything. And the way that Tchaikovsky was consistently kind of badgering Rimsky Korsakov and telling him, what are you doing? You're just teaching. You got to create, you got to produce. And I think a lot of that actually helped Rimsky Korsakov to finally produce his masterpieces, uh, Shahrazad being one of them. But that was very interesting to me. And also um, the um, Princess Irina later on in her life marries this gentleman by the name of Felix Yusupov. Uh, you, and you, if you're familiar with um, St. Petersburg, there's that Yusupov Palace, and he was the richest man uh, rich, from the richest family in Russia at the time. And so the Tsar's family really wanted to have this union happen. And Felix Yusupov, of course, uh, was the man who uh, had a part in the assassination of the monk Rasputin. So it was very interesting to read that uh, story and how all of that happened, which itself is, of course, and actually, Yusupov himself has written a book about the affair, actually admitting that he and Grand Duke Dmitri, his cousin, uh, I mean, Irina's cousin, uh, murdered Rasputin. This is why it takes six years to write a book, <laughs> because you get down all these paths. OK, let's have uh, Fred. Fred had a question. Uh, Fred Parvana. And uh, after that, we can go to Jack. Great. Hi, Sepe, how are you? Hi, Fred, thank you very much. Uh, as full disclosures go, I've known Sepe for close to, what, 55 years now? But anyway, <laughs> I was following the comments on your on social media about your book. It seems like there's a lot of interest from people to see the book as a movie. Uh, have you been in touch with anybody about this? And is, this, is that something that you might consider? Thank you for the question, Fred. And yes, Fred and I have known each other from third grade. So uh, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> he says, unfortunately, I say fortunately. But um, yes, thank you. There has been. And actually, uh, I can say probably four producers have a book in hand at, the, at this time. But having a book in hand and having something happen uh, is uh, two different things. When Shaheen and I were uh, doing our music um, back when we, we got featured on NPR at that time for our album World Cafe, we got uh, approached by public television and they said, you know, Yanni has done this live at Acropolis, uh, the new age musician, and you guys can go do some sort of like live at Persepolis. And we loved the idea and we decided to do it and we got two producers that helped us and we wrote it and it was going to be called Echoes of Persia and we were ready to go when the Iraq war happened. And when that happened, they got cold feet and didn't want to go to that region at all and it fell apart. So I know how it is where you could be at the last stages of, of a producer or a director saying, you know, we're very interested in this and we're about to go and then nothing happens with it. But uh, the reason it's interesting that you asked that question is that I wrote the book as a movie in my head. I mean, I know sometimes when uh, books are gonna be turned into movies, you need a screenwriter and a screenplay. But I was all the time seeing the scenes in my head and that's how I wrote them. And so uh, that's where that, uh, you know, there's a juncture there between the book and visual and uh, the books. I don't know if you can that's hear the, the thunderstorm. The gods are not happy with yeah. this at the moment, no, apparently. No. <laughs> but, and, and visual reminds me, we do have many more questions. I want to get to them, but, um, Mike, do you want to put up that PowerPoint? Sapir shared with us a PowerPoint, which uh, has some pictures of some of his relatives in there, right. uh, which I think, yeah, most of you hopefully can see. Well, th thank you. This is just a map. I wanted to put a map really uh, quickly to show you in the early 1900s, the relationship between Persia and Russia. And uh, uh, you see those three mountain ranges right there. That's in Georgia. And so to get to St. Petersburg, which is way up there where the Baltic Sea is, uh, you'd have to cross the, either the mountains or the Caspian. And so on his way home, he crosses uh, the Caspian the first time he comes home. And then when he goes back, he uses, goes by train because by then the train route had uh, opened. But it was a very difficult and tiresome trip. And so that's why I had that picture there. We can go to the next slide. This is my grandfather to the left, Nasr Sultan. Um, he 
is sitting here in a cafe in 1905 in St. Petersburg. He is to the left with a clarinet in his hand standing with uh, a group of Russian musicians and their wives or girlfriends. I don't know who they are. <laughs> Next slide, please. That is uh, the Cossack Brigade Band. This is a band that my great grandfather, Salar Moazaz, in the center there with the boots on and standing very tall and firm, uh, he conducted this band and they were basically military people that were learning music. And it was this band that he was trying to westernize and uh, have them play symphonies and kind of more of an orchestral type of music rather than the traditional hymns and religious uh, music that was being played before that. Um, and this is the first, uh, this is a sheet music in 1909 of the first national anthem uh, that Persia had. And um, the reason my great grandfather Salam Wazaz wrote that is that Tehran had been um, taken over by basically by the Russian uh, commander of the Cossack Brigade Army, uh, which was a man by the name of Vladimir Lyakov. And finally, the Persian people revolted, and, and especially from the north of Iran, they came in Tehran and they liberated Tehran in July of 1909. And in honor of that, my grand, great grandfather wrote the what was to become the first national anthem. And this is my great grandfather, Salar Moazaz, again, who wrote the national anthem. And this is his youngest son, who his name was Olam Hossein. He was the youngest brother of Nasser Sultan, my grandfather. And Olam Hossein went to Berlin and studied in Geneva at the conservatory and came back to Tehran. And he started the Tehran Symphony Orchestra, which today still uh, performs music by Iranian and also Western classical composers. And this is Nasser Sultan, the year 1913, where he met Irina, the princess, and became her piano tutor. And this is a picture actually taken in St. Petersburg with the FACO background of St. Petersburg in the, wherever they were standing nice. taking the picture. This is my grandmother. Uh, her name is Mammy, and she has a prominent role in this book because she tells the story. And uh, this is a woman in 1919 Tehran, uh, 100 years ago. Uh, the, the, it's interesting to see the difference between now and 100 years later. Uh, you wouldn't find a woman uh, having, not having her hair covered like this uh, and having that bob that she has sort of bohemian style. And this is just Nasser Sultan. He's the, uh, in the second row with the white cap to the left. Uh, with a bunch of Russians and their families. And I assume, I'm not 100% sure, the man with the kind of handlebar mustache, uh, three, three men down to the right of him, was probably Lyakov. Okay. And this is Reza Shah. So uh, the Shah that got deposed by the revolution uh, in 1979, uh, you know, this is his father, Reza Shah, who started the Pahlavi dynasty. And behind him, to the viewer's right, is my grandfather, Nasser Sultan Mimbasha. And what's very interesting is that this is done in 1925, this picture. 20 years later, Reza Shah's daughter marries Nasser Sultan's son. And this is my gr grandfather, Nasser Sultan Mimbasha. Uh, there's a part in the book, uh, there's a chapter called Black Eyes, uh, that song Ochichorni uh, of the Russian, uh, Dark Eyes. And uh, my grandfather was known to have those kind of fiery dark eyes. That's the year that he became the director of the Iranian Conservatory. This is a picture of Mossadegh. A lot of uh, Americans may know Mossadegh uh, in an airplane coming to the United States and to the far right, the man with the glasses is Alayar Saleh, which is my great uncle, uh, Nasser Sultan's brother-in-law. And he became a uh, notable authority in his own right. He became the ambassador of Iran to the United States during the time of Harry Truman. And this is the picture of the son of Nasser Sultan and the daughter of Reza Shah, who had married at this time, 
um, that's my uncle, uh, Merdad Palbod, sitting with his hands clasped. And that's uh, his wife, Princess Shams. Uh, and in the middle there, which is very interesting, this is in 1956 in the city of Abadan, uh, near the Persian Gulf. And that is Dizzy Gillespie, the jazz artist. This is 1956 in Iran. Nice. And this final picture is my uncle, Fatullah Mibashan, the gentleman I mentioned, who was the commander of the garrison and with the Shah during war games, actually near Shiraz in 1965. And what's very interesting in the book, my grandfather, Nasser Sultan, becomes the band leader at the garrison of Shiraz. And then 70 years later, his son became the commander of that same garrison. And then okay. this is the cover of the book. If anybody hasn't seen it, of course, Mark showed it, but, uh, and it's available. Uh, my website is separadot.com. The book is available, uh, of course, everywhere now um, in ebook and audiobooks coming out next month. Uh, but the fastest and easiest way to get it, of course, is Amazon. But if you're not an Amazon fan, it's at Barnes and Noble and Apple and everywhere else. Okay, so you had a picture there of your grandmother, um, and I think that, was it Jack had a question about that? Uh, yes, Jack Housinger. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah, so your grandmother tells you this story about your grandfather's greatest love of all time. <laughs> Is she jealous at all, or does she, it, it, I mean, she has to settle for being the second choice, I guess. Well, they weren't in a direct competition, so that's why it didn't hurt her feelings that much. But um, I think uh, what was interesting is that my grandmother was telling me this story like 60 years after, you know, my or 50 years after my grandfather had already passed. So as you know, time he heals all wounds. So it wasn't, she was telling it now as a interesting story rather as, an, as a story of her lost love or I mean, uh, of her husband having loved somebody else. But there is very interesting uh, interplay in the final chapters of the book about this when Nasser Sultan does tell my grandmother this whole story. At some point he relents and tells her the whole thing. And she's not that happy at that point. <laughs> so Mary McKinnon actually asked the same question or similar question. Uh, Mary, I don't know if you wanna follow up with anything. Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, hello, Saper. Hi, Mary. I, I worked years. with Mary 30 years ago in California. <laughs> oh, God, at least 30. Yeah, I was back in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <I'm> more. <laughs> That's 40 years, yeah. Yeah, I think part of the question got answered. I was like, was your grandfather alive when your grandmother told you the story? But obviously, he was long gone. So right. I guess not. But it's such a charming story in so many ways. But so funny that it was your grandmother who's the one who told you the story. And now it's sort of, be, I'm sure, become part of your family history or your family. Yes, list. exactly. <laughs> exactly. Codify, which is great. It's just absolutely <laughs> fabulous. So I haven't had a chance to read it. I think I messaged you and said when I went to visit my mother last week, who's got some memory issues, but she likes to read and she saw your book and took it and started reading it. So I left it with her. And <laughs> great. Thank you for doing her that. Her another <laughs> one. So yeah, she seemed to be charmed by it. So that was all good. So anyway, congratulations. I mean, when I knew Sipari, you know, we were working at this Oh, little consulting firm that has a lot of stories there. But anyway, um, you know, you, you went off to do bigger and better things, music and writing a book and working at the EPA. I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Far well, thank from, you very much. Those days. Yeah. It was always a pleasure working with you. Yeah, that was great. Great to see you. <laughs> so let's go to uh, Nicoletta Papadopoulos. And while we're waiting for Nicoletta, I'm just going to say that Susie Katami, I think of KQED, said that uh, she had the pleasure of reading, uh, to interview Sapir on her show, which yes, I think you can did. find the interview just today it aired. Um, and she's happy, his book is great, and she's happy to recommend it to others. Yes, she's, very, she's a great journalist. I really thank her for her support. Okay, go ahead, Nicoletta. Well, Sapir, hello, how are you? Hello, Nicoletta, how are you? You're back very from proud. Romania. <laughs> Okay, so my question was, have you ever been to Russia and did you have a chance uh, connecting to any of the relatives nowadays of Irina's? 
No, you know, uh, unfortunately, I haven't been to Russia. <laughs> I have not. And that's, that's, uh, hopefully, we're going to go for a book signing at some point. But uh, no, well, I, I hope Amazon, I hope Amazon gets it there as well. Uh, yes, you, know, I, you know, I checked, I don't think Amazon uh, has the book there yet. But my book is in Russia, through mm -hmm. other outlets, I've seen it there. Um, and uh, I haven't had a chance to communicate with any of Irina's family. I'm not even sure if they would like this story or even believe <laughs> it. But right. you know, this, uh, the whole reason I didn't even put any of the royal, Russian royal family's picture in the book is because the book really wasn't about them. It was about my family. And so of that's course. why I, I didn't include any of their pictures. Any, any story we might expect from you in the future? <laughs> you never know you know the family <laughs> trait <laughs> you never all right know. thank thank you Saper. thank you Nicoletto. Um, thank you so um susie did you have something you wanted to add if so we can unmute you um and after that we can go to uh steven jarbo Oh, well, he's just, Stephen Jorbo just says, actually, looking forward to more books and music from Sapir. Oh, thank you. Thank Not you. a question, very, it's just an exclamation nice. point. I appreciate Hi, it. Hi, Susie. Hi, Susie. She's still muted, I think. She is. Those yeah. radio people, you know? <laughs> um, um, uh, let me go through some, uh, well, actually, let's go to, uh, let's, let's, let's go to Nancy. Hello there. Oh, wait. Well, Hello, Susie. Yes, yes, you said radio people and I didn't like it. I wanted to prove, it, <laughs> That's prove good. that I'm a radio person, but I'm also a TV journalist. So yeah. there I am. It's, <laughs> it's been lovely listening to you guys talk. And I certainly enjoyed the book as well as enjoying interviewing you, Seper. And I remember the day you were talking to me, you talked about your book, um, doing great in Russia. Am I right remembering that? Uh, well, we no, it's, it? it was number three best uh, uh, Russian historical fiction bestseller. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yes, yes. So, so we're hoping that's gonna continue with other countries as well. I hope so. And I thank you, Susie. You were the first person to interview me when the book came out, so. Uh... My pleasure. I consider <laughs> myself lucky and honored. I let thank other you. people ask questions. All the best, and I'm here. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Let's go to Nancy and uh, Nancy, looking at your question, it looks like he might have an easier time answering the second question than the first, but. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Sofair. It's, it's, Hi. it's Ildrin Fritz here. Um, great to see you. I loved the book. Um, and Thank so you. nice, um, just kind of the connection of, of knowing your boys and everything. Um, I was just wondering, um, how did you end up in the U.S.? The book kind of ends with your relatives there, and I'm wondering, what was your journey um, to the United States? Uh, you mean when I first came for college, or? Well, yes. I. How did you? Well, most people don't know where, I mean, that you even, that you started here. You oh, started yes. No, here. I was born. I was born here. My parents were students here, and so oh, I was born in Washington, and we went back to Iran when I was the age of seven. Uh, that's when I got the chance to become friends with Fred that was just on the line <laughs> in third grade. Uh, but uh, yes, at the age of seven, and then like many Iranians, at least in our international school, we had the opportunity and the blessing that we could come and get the best education here in the United States. And many of us came uh, to the States and went to California, actually. And uh, as I said, I'd studied international agricultural development to go back and work in the agricultural sector in Iran. Uh, but when the revolution happened, that, uh, that dream was put to rest. And um, uh, ever since we've been here and loving it, you know, it's fantastic. <laughs> right. how, how did your parents come to the United States? Oh, that's a very interesting story too. Yes, in 1947, my father came to the United States by car through, not by car to the United States, but by car from Tehran to, back, to Lebanon. And then from Lebanon, they took a retrofitted American naval ship that was used to ferry passengers to come to New York City. So he came to New York City in 1947 and he met my mother in 1949. And she had also come uh, two years later, of course, and they, they met in New York City and married, and then they moved to Washington, D.C., 
where I was born. My brother Kave was born in New York City. And, and f so, and why, um, I mean, obviously I work for the University of California. I love the University of California. Why out of all the universities in the world did you end up at UC Davis? Well, uh, my father had a very good friend that luckily for us uh, was the Minister of Agriculture in Iran. Uh, his name was Dr. Ahmadi. Unfortunately, he passed away a few, uh, a few uh, about a year ago. Uh, but he was a very good family friend. And so one day he was gracious enough to allow me to have a meeting with him. And I asked him, I said, if I want to study agriculture, which universities in the U.S. do you consider the best? And he named three. He said Cornell, uh, Purdue, and UC Davis. And I opened the encyclopedia that we had back then, because no Google. And I looked and I realized that California... <laughs> the you know no harsh winters like Cornell and then also a bunch of my friends were going to California so UC Davis was one of the choices he suggested and so I, I took the advice. <laughs> Do you think that and I'm sure that there are probably people on the call who might have first-hand experience and could answer it better but do you think students today at a place like Davis uh, or any American college would feel stigmatization problems with Iran. Obviously, Iran is still villainized by American politicians constantly. I don't, I don't think these days anymore, because back then, this was the first time that some other country, and especially not a superpower at the time, had done something to the United States that there was no way we could get even, you know? It was like you couldn't go ahead and bomb them because the hostages were there. So there was this anger that everybody felt, myself included, you know, my family, everybody, we were just nervous about this situation. Um, and because it was the first time, it, it was very unique. Nowadays, uh, no, because of social media and people, and back then, not many people knew Persians as well in Iranians, as well as they do now. Now, uh, in LA, they call uh, Los Angeles Tehrangelis, so. <laughs> Um, so a couple of uh, anonymous questions I'm going to group together because they're related. How much research did you do in writing the book? What advice do you have to others who would like to dabble at writing? And what was the best money you spent with regard to your writing? And did you have a particular schedule you followed when writing? So these are all about the process of writing. Great. Uh, so uh, first of all, the best money I spent, I think, was on a... Um, grammar software called Grammarly that everybody should buy. It's very inexpensive. It helps. They have, you a, free oh, they they have a free version. They have a free version. version. Oh yeah. Well, I couldn't use that one. I had to go with the, <laughs> because I needed to do more than just write an email, but um, that really helps. It, it's an amazing software. Um, and uh, the writing process, basically my point is, you just got to sit down with pen and paper or typewriter or whatever you like to use as your mode of uh, putting uh, ideas down and just do it. Just start you didn't writing. Use pen and paper, did you? Uh, well, yes, because pen and paper, not to write most of the story, but as I'm sitting there talking to somebody and they say something, and I think, oh, that reminded me. I have to, and then I would start write, writing stuff, but then later on, of course, transfer it. Um, and what were the other two questions? Uh, um, how much research did it oh, take? A lot of research. It took, uh, I thought it would take a year. It took five years because as you do research, you find more and more things. For example, a very interesting part of this research, I'll say it real quick, was my grandmother told me the story. And she, when she told it to me, um, it, it was that Nasser Sota, my grandfather, was about 27 and the princess was about 17 at the time that they meet, a turning 18. And so when I got the first article and I was reading it, it, it didn't look like my grandfather would have been uh, 27 as opposed to 17. It looked like he would be 20 and she would be 13. And so at first I thought to myself, it's a fiction book, so I'll just make it up and say they were. But it then- It's just a little creepy if she's only 13. Right, and that's why I, would, I wouldn't have written it that way. <laughs> but what happened is that my uncle, uh, Mayor Dot Palpud, who was the minister of fine arts that you saw him married to the princess in those pictures, 
he sent me an article. Unfortunately, he passed away also a year and a half ago. But before he passed away, I would talk to him a lot. He sent me this article that showed that my grandfather went back to Russia one year in 1913 to study orchestration and harmony uh, at St. Petersburg. So he went back for just one year. And that was actually the year in 1913 that he did tutor her. And she was 17, turning 18 at the time. Um, let's go to uh, Kava and Mitra, who now have questioned uh, one of them. And, um, and meanwhile, I will read you from Sam, who says, we purchased a book, look forward to reading it. Thank you for sharing the story. Congratulations on your accomplishment from Michelle and Sam. Thank you. Thank you so much. So go ahead, Kava or Mitra. Just got to unmute yourselves. Hi there. Hello. Hi, Sebaju. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, I I believe writing a book is not easy. So you had to follow. You had to have a discipline that you followed. Uh, following that discipline, what did you learn about yourself? Um, can you write more? Did you have like the genre? Are there other genres that you would like? Because the book was so well done. Um, it was romantic, it was historical, it was educational. We, I would love to see more. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, uh, the, that's a good segue back into the other question because they had asked, what was your process? You know, how did you schedule it? You, you are correct. It is so difficult if you, because I'm retired right now from the EPA. So it's so difficult if you are basically retired and you have nobody pushing you all the time saying, you know, uh, where is it? What have you done and all that? You know, the publisher is very uh, lenient. And so um, what I would do is I would get up with my wife. My, my wife still works at the EPA. So when she would get up at 6.30 in the morning, I would also get up and say, okay, that's my work day. And so I would basically try to work until she finished her work. I would sit at the computer, do the research, do some writing. Of course, as a writer, uh, just like with music, some days you just can't write. No matter how you try, you can't write. And so those days were the most difficult. And I used those to do research. Um, let's go to Marcy, somebody very close to me. <laughs> Hello, Marcy. Hi, Sipair. <laughs> um, I, I think you covered this in the book, but I'm not 100% sure. Did your parents know this story? Oh, very interesting. Yes. Yeah. So the day my grandmother told me the story, um, we're going back home and I told my mother, this was during the time of the martial law. So when we first got in the car to go home, all of the tanks and the personnel carriers and the soldiers. So we didn't have a time to talk. We were just all awestruck and looking outside the windows and worried that somebody might, you know, mistake us for some uh, doing something we should be doing and maybe shoot us or something. So nobody talked on the way home until we got to the northern part of Tehran. And I say this in the book that Tehran is a very interesting city in that there's a clear north-south divide. And as we got more and more towards the mountains and the north, it was almost as if martial law had not even been declared. There was nothing in the northern parts of the town. And then I was relaxed enough to ask my mother, I said, you know, my, your mother just told me this thing about our grandfather, your father. Uh, did you know that? It, and the only thing she knew, she said, no, I knew he went to St. Petersburg and studied music there for many years with my, with her grandfather. But besides that, she didn't know anything about this. And, and that was what was intriguing to me. How could it be that such a story had just remained uh, under wraps for so long? And why my grandmother decided at that time to tell me that story. I think if this whole martial law hadn't happened, this story would have never come out because mm -hmm. I would have never asked her about Khomeini and then she would have never said, there's other things you don't know. <laughs> yeah, I love that, I love that. Um, and I also, one thing I really loved in the book was when he finally makes it to the Hermitage um, and takes a look at that painting. I'm, you know, maybe you just made this up, but the comparison between, you know, painted art and music I thought was just wonderful. And then you've talked about uh, how it also applies to writing too. And so it's the arts. Yes, it's a really a rhythm and balance and harmony. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, as you say, Marcy, that, that was a very special chapter for myself. I really enjoyed writing that because 
uh, I love Matisse paintings, and this is called The Red Room, um, Matisse's painting, and uh, or Harmony in Red. It, it has two names. Mm -hmm. And this uh, was a painting that was purchased by uh, Shukin, uh, who was the uh, art collector, and finally uh, placed in the Hermitage. And um, Nasser Sultan almost hears the painting. And that's what I loved when uh, Nasser Sultan's watching it, but he almost hears the painting. And then I studied this and realized there are people that when they do see certain colors, they can hear music. <laughs> that, that's a phenomenon. There is that. All right, we only have time for just a couple more. I'm gonna go back to Moonjung because I see your question here. It's an excellent question. And uh, I, I'm curious to hear your answer. Hi, Moonjung. Hello. Um can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, okay. Um, so I was wondering how Iranian music has changed over time from the time period in your book until today. And I was wondering if um, there's any time period of Iranian music that you think is most representative of your culture and the pride. Thank you, great question. Well, Persian music, uh, traditional Persian music, um, basically initially was um, based on, um, religious hymns. And um, so I think to the Western ear, Persian music may sound, the tuning of it may sound, you know, kind of awkward or different. Um, and so what my, and back, back then in Iran, uh, teaching uh, music and uh, learning music wasn't really something that uh, people thought of highly. Um, and even when I went into the music business, Shaheen and Saper, and we, he, we had a success here with Virgin Records, uh, still I could tell that there was not a stigma, but my parents were more impressed that I was a bureaucrat at the EPA working for the government rather than making music, you know, <laughs> even though we went on the charts and went to number six on Billboard, but still my father was very happy that I had the government job, you know. Uh, so what my great grandfather tried to do and my grandfather, they tried to bring the idea of music education, general music education, which was totally a foreign idea to the populace uh, in Iran. And that's why they started the conservatory there to bring in more of the symphonic orchestral like the woodwinds and the, uh, you know, the uh, cellos and things like that. Um, and to answer your question, the, I, I, the most reflective music of the traditional Persians are, is are exactly that traditional Persian music with the hammer dulcimers and spike fiddles and tambourines and things like that. But I think during the 60s and 70s, pop music influenced Persian music. And so we had a lot of nice uh, Persian music, Persian melodies, that also had pop rhythms to them. And that was pleasant because the, the younger generation uh, started finding a very, um, a desire to listen to that kind of music. How do you describe your music? Uh, yeah, how do you describe your music? Uh, the music that Chayin and I perform? Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, you know, a lot of people give it the misnomer of world music, but it's not really world music um, because our music is basically uh, based on principles of pop and rock but Shaheen plays the music such that he uses Persian melodies in there. And so our, the basis of our music is pop and rock with the structures such as that. But then Shaheen plays the guitar sometimes like a Arabic oud or a Persian, uh, you know, tar. So it's, it's an interesting combination. So in that regard, you could call it world music where you have a Brazilian beat or a pop beat and then a Persian melody on top of that. I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, this, this has been absolutely uh, fascinating and, um, you know, I don't want to say we'll have you back when you write your next book because <laughs> you're an old man by then, but uh, uh, thank you for everybody who listened. Uh, thank you, Sapere, for sharing all these stories. Like I said, I've heard bits and pieces of Sapere's stories for years and about 10 years ago, he started, six years ago, he started talking about this Russian princess. I had no idea what he was talking about, <laughs> but, but then you pick up the book. It's like, oh. It was the czar's niece he's talking about, of course, a Russian princess. And um, uh, it starts out unfamiliar, but then like good music, you couldn't put it down. Uh, so I recommend it. And thank, thank you, you for doing this. And uh, good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>